Happy Easter, everyone. Welcome to Commons Church. Hey, would you stand with us? It is Easter Sunday, and it is an incredible time to celebrate together Christ's resurrection. So hey, whether you're joining us here in the room or you're online, I want to invite you to sing with us and to worship together. All right, here we go, everybody. Hello, everyone. We are so happy to have you here in the room with us, those of you who are joining online as well. Let's take a moment. It seems only appropriate. If you haven't already, let's take a sec. Say Happy Easter to someone standing next to you, maybe two or three people. Let's do it. I'm going to do it right here. Happy Easter. (laughs) Happy Easter, guys. Happy Easter, Mike. Rebecca. There we go. 
That's so lovely. Thanks for extending that welcome. A special welcome, especially to those of you who are joining us for the first time. You might be here with your family. You might be joining some friends. Maybe you're just joining us because you're checking out Commons Church, whatever the case. We're so honored to have you on this brightest Sunday of the year. And if you are new with us today, we invite you to visit the blue wall right at the back of the room there before you head out. We would love to meet you. That's also where you can pick up one of these journals. They're made especially with you in mind, so you can track with the information around our community and also our teaching. And now, as a new dawn breaks and new life bursts all around, let's begin with a call to worship taken from Mark chapter 16. Very early, on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome They went out to anoint Jesus' body, and on their way, they were talking to each other, saying, who's going to roll away the stone? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away from the tomb, and as they entered it, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting to the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be afraid, he said to them. You're looking for Jesus the Nazarene who was crucified. He has risen. He has risen indeed. So let every aching heart rejoice. Join us as we worship today.
Sing it together. Come on.
we sing it again, every voice. Come on. And then sings my soul. you to find a seat and take a look at the screens. Immense in mercy and with an incredible love, God embraced us. God took our sin-dead lives and made us alive in Christ. Then God picked us up and set us down in the highest heaven in company with Jesus, the one who saves. Now God has us where God wants us, with all the time in this world to shower us with grace. God creates each of us by Christ Jesus to join the good work God has ready for us to do. Christ created community for all through his death on the cross. Through the cross we were all embraced and that was the end of hostility. Christ came and preached peace to us all, treated us as equals. You're no longer wandering exiles. The kingdom of faith is now your home country. You're no longer strangers or outsiders. You belong here. God is building a home, using us all, irrespective of how we got here in what God is building. Now God is using you, fitting you in brick by brick, stone by stone, with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone that holds all the parts together. We see it taking shape day after day, a holy dwelling built by God, all of us built into it, a place in which God is quiet at home. God is welcoming you, fitting you in brick by brick and stone by stone, story upon story upon story, with Christ Jesus at the center who holds us all together. And this is why we celebrate, because there is room for all of us in resurrection, space for all of our stories to be caught up in the life that returns with Jesus. And yet, of course, that journey to that realization is long and winding, just as winding as our paths to this moment, as dark and sorrowful as the path through Good Friday. Sometimes the way is crooked and labored. It's two steps forward and one step back for so much longer than any of us might like. But the celebration of Easter is about the divine mystery of grace and all the ways that it comes to find us. Stories of healing and of kind words, brilliant moments and then quiet reflections. All the points in our lives where the love of God is so evident that it simply can no longer be ignored because all of this is resurrection. And today we stand in the long line of people who have followed the way, trusting that good news is out there looking for us. And so we declare together today, Christ is risen, together Christ is risen indeed. If anyone is devout and a lover of God, let them enjoy this beautiful and radiant day. If anyone is a grateful servant, let them rejoicing enter into the joy of the Lord. If anyone has wearied themselves in fasting, let them now receive recompense. For the master is gracious and receives the last even as the first. God gives rest to those who come at the 11th hour, just as those who have labored from the first. To the one God gives, and to the other God is gracious. For Christ is risen and not one dead remains. So I invite you today to the Easter table, 
not because you must, but because you are welcome here. I invite you to come to the Easter table today to testify not that you are righteous, but that you desire to love what is good. I invite you to come to the Easter table today not because you are strong, but precisely because all of us are weak. Not because we have any claim on the grace of God, but because in our frailty, we stand in constant need of breath and new life and resurrection. We invite you to come not to express an opinion or a belief or a doctrine, but simply to welcome God's presence and to experience God's goodness this day, to declare that this is where life returns to us. So as we sing again, I'm going to invite those in the sanctuary, in the balcony to come up and down the center aisle to take the bread and the grape and hear the words of blessing spoken over you and then to eat as you return to your seats using the outside aisles. For those seated in the gym, you're going to come forward using your center aisle, take the elements and eat and return along the outside edges. If for any reason you would like to receive the Eucharist in your seat, then just give me a wave. I'll be at the back at the blue wall and I will come to serve you. And of course, if you would prefer a gluten-free or a pre-packaged option, you can find those with me at the blue wall as well. But welcome to Easter Sunday. Welcome to the table of Christ. Welcome to the resurrection that has come to find you. Now it is busy today and this will take some time as we move and shuffle and find our way to the table. But even that is part of the celebration. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Please come and eat together.
together as we declare these words. Let's stand together. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I bet in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless Sing this together, every voice we sing Christ alone. So check out the screens for a special commons announcement. It's Easter, and we are in the mood to celebrate, and so we couldn't think of a better time to announce our next big party at Commons, because this September, Commons Church turns 10 years old, if you can believe it. And to help make that memorable, we have booked out the Jack Singer Concert Hall at Arts Commons in downtown Calgary for Sunday, September 8th. Now, the Jack Singer, if you haven't been there before, is one of the most beautiful concert venues, not just here in the city, but legitimately anywhere in the country. And the Jack Singer can host more than 1,500 guests at a time, which means that for the very first time, since our very first Sunday, we will be able to have the entire Commons community together under one roof, together in one worship service for the day. Some of you may not realize this, but we had to move to two services on our second Sunday here in Kensington, And I think it's pretty wonderful that once a decade, we get to do it all again together. Now, we have secured parking on site that will come free with your free ticket. We have program spaces available from nursery to grade six for your kids. We are pulling out all of the stops to make this a great weekend to celebrate just how incredibly gracious God has been to us at Commons and to look forward to where we believe God is calling us in our next decade together. Now, we've set up a special website. You can find it at www.commons10.info. That is commons10.info. You can check out the site right now. It's live and bookmark it for later because free tickets will be available starting June 1st. However, we would love you to mark September 8th, 2024 in your calendar right now because we're turning 10 and we absolutely do not want to do that without you. Now, today is, of course, a celebration in its own right, actually a much larger celebration of resurrection. And so we are incredibly grateful that you've taken part of your Easter weekend to spend with us. Uh, we never take that for granted. So thank you for being here today. If you're new to Commons, we are going to take a coffee break in just a moment here. But there are a few things I want to make you aware of before we do that. First, we would love you to stop by the blue wall at the back of the room before you leave today to say hi and talk to someone from our team. 
We have free copies of our books and journal, and I think even a mug back there waiting for you. But I would love to give you a copy of Dirt and Stardust for free before you leave today. You can also scan the QR code on the chair in front of you if that's more your speed to say hi to us as well. Families, you can always check in your kids at the Blue Wall, but if you are new to Commons today, then at the coffee break, you're going to want to head straight downstairs, and that way our team can get your family registered to make sure your kids are safe and secure in their classrooms. Junior high students, you guys at the break can head straight down to your class as well. But of course, this is Easter, and that means it is a celebration both of God's goodness to us and the goodness we get to pass along to others. And so after the service today, you may have already seen this in the back of the room, but we have special Easter treats for everyone, color-coded macarons and a photo booth at the front so you can take a photo with your family before you leave. That's our gift to you. But also, by the exits today, we have special commons cupboard grocery bags that you can pick up. They are free to you, but our hope is that in the next week and months, you can fill those for your neighbor and then drop them here off at the church to help resource our commons cupboard that provides free food, no questions asked, 24-7 to anyone in the neighborhood year-round. There's a very real need, and your shopping always contributes to that. But as a community, we have also committed $24,000 this year to food security initiatives in the neighborhood. We think the gift of an Easter sweet and the gift of our generosity to our neighbors can be just one small way we make tangible the story of Easter this year. So check those out before you leave. All right, it's time for a coffee break. If you want to make a donation, we're extremely grateful for that. You can hit up commons.church anytime. Thank you for your support. Grab yourself a coffee, check your kids in downstairs, take a photo, and we'll be back in six minutes. Let's try this one more time before you leave. Christ is risen. That was the best one yet. All right, we'll see you back in a few minutes. Thanks, everyone. Hello, everyone. My name is Yelena. I'm part of the Commons team, and we are delighted to have you join us today to celebrate Easter together. And wherever you are today, gathering with family or friends, or perhaps marking this day on your own, whatever this day might look like for you, receive this Easter blessing. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. And in him, the Easter story becomes our story and our hope. So with the heart, once again, attuned to the love that is stronger than death, may you welcome the mystery of divine work in your life. May you trust that even today in Christ, God is leading you through death to resurrection. And may you stay open to the possibility of new life that comes to find you wherever you are. Christ behind you in all of your yesterdays, Christ with you in your today, and Christ before you in all of your tomorrows. For Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter to you and your loved ones. Now, the Christian tradition sets aside 50 days for the Easter season. After fasting and waiting and walking with Christ through the Passion Week, we take extra time to celebrate the resurrection. We take time to practice resurrection as a way of life, and we take time to live into the joy of the new creation. And with that, during the Easter season this year, we will lean heavily into the theme of joy. And we invite you to journey with us through our next sermon series called Joy, A Theology of Celebration. In today's world, we all are more than familiar with doom scrolling and upsetting news cycles and algorithms that manipulate our attention. There are some big forces in our lives that push us to feel bad about almost everything. But deep down, we all know that feeling bad forever is not how we heal or shape a better world. What makes us feel alive is often found in laughter and hilarious banter and in not taking ourselves too seriously. Can you imagine for a minute that the heart of God actually loves a good joke with a classic setup and punchline, the zanier the better. And what if, when we come together in community to celebrate 
every blessing. We find that joy liberates us, one hearty laugh at a time. So please join us for our first conversation about joy next week. But today, we will be right back to continue our worship service with the Easter message. And on behalf of our whole team, once again, I want to wish you a very happy Easter. Thanks for being here.
Hello, hello. Welcome to Commons. Happy Easter, everyone. You all look so lovely in your Easter best. Easter is such a high point in the year at Commons. There are, there will be macarons after the service. 10th anniversary announcements, coordinating decor with the journal, a choir? What even is this place? It's your place, actually. <laughs> Honestly, we're so glad that you're here for all of it. Now, when I preach on Easter, I like to begin with a joke, you know, for joy. So here it is. Why does the Easter bunny have such a good complexion? because he exfoliates. <laughs> now let me introduce myself. I'm Bobby, I also exfoliate. Today we join our voices together, whether we're feeling all that joy or not, and we proclaim yet again, Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. Alleluia. Now we have been in the Gospel of Mark all Lent, and Anytime we spend a bunch of time in one of the Gospels, I'm always like, yeah, this Gospel, this one is my favorite. I heart the Gospel of Mark. And one of the neat things Mark does is leave all of this room at the end of the story. And some folks even say that the first part of Mark is basically prologue, just so Mark can get to the passion, the story of Christ crucified. And so we remember the story. We began Holy Week on Palm Sunday, and Jeremy talked about the lead up to the triumphal procession into Jerusalem through the disciples' denial of Jesus's thrice predicted death. And then on Good Friday, Scott drew us into the story of the woman anointing Jesus's feet for death. And that's only one interaction Jesus has on his way to the cross, where, as Scott put it, God dares to be so wasteful and poured out. And today, we pick up the rest of Holy Week in Mark chapter 14. But first, let's catch our breath a little and let us pray. God of the sunrise, we saw you in humble places this holy week, washing feet and offering bread and praying in a garden, being deserted and alone. And we waited in holy vigil, holding our breath with you at the tomb. And now we see you on Easter Sunday, no longer bound by death and hate, and as we trace the story again today, we take a moment to take care, to breathe in a little more peace, to breathe out some of your shared passion and your suffering. We know that there is still so much pain in the world and in our relationships, even in our own bodies and our minds. And we sit here today in need of Easter all over again. So from the top of our heads to the bottom of our feet, may resurrection life pull us forward to love and serve like Jesus. Amen. So we wrap up the Gospel of Mark together today, and we'll go low before we get to Easter's high. But first, here's my question. How often do your nightmares come true? Now, it's Easter, not Halloween, I know, but humor me. Last week, I had a bad dream where I was trying to escape a building that looked a lot like it came from The Handmaid's Tale. And I can't even tell you what was chasing me. Who knows, maybe it was that exfoliated Easter bunny. It'd be terrifying, hard to say. But usually, my nightmares don't come true. And today we drop into Jesus's nightmare, the one that actually happened. And while there are so many depictions of Jesus as this pitiable victim, I think he operates with a curious amount of control. Like he's saying to every force that violates him, 
You made this nightmare, but I will wake you up from it. So we are thrown into a dark scene. It's night, and the high priest, the chief priest, the elders, and the scribes gather to look for just the right testimony to find cause to kill Jesus. But the gathered testimony is a mess of contradiction. And in exasperation, the high priests ask, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, Jesus is quiet at first. He doesn't dignify the lies that are swirling around him, but he does speak up about his identity. And when he tells this cobbled together court, meeting under the guise of the night, that he is the picture of the prophet Daniel's vision, where the Son of Man, or the truly human one, comes down from heaven to usher in a kingdom that will never end. He's telling them that contrary to how it looks, where it counts, they have no real power to judge him. With his silence and few words, Jesus judges them. And it is a strange sort of climax that in this dark place, Jesus steps into the light. So the next morning, the nightmare continues. The religious leaders are in cahoots with the state. It turns out that both sides want Jesus dead and one can't do it without the other. And Jesus is hauled before the Roman governor Pilate. And Pilate asks him, are you the king of the Jews? And take note, this is not a gentle question. Pilate is not a good guy. The ancient philosopher Philo described Pilate as naturally inflexible, a blend of self-will and relentlessness. So how do you think a merciless governor meant to keep peace in this region for Rome puts a stop to a movement that is hedging on rebellion? Well, by squashing it, of course, without making it look like he's to blame. So Pilate asks the crowd, I'll free one of two men. The choice is up to you, Jesus, whom Pilate has called the king of the Jews. And that's not a compliment, by the way. It's a threat. Or Barabbas, whose name can be translated as son of the father. And that is eerie as if he and Jesus have this same nickname, one being jailed for violence and the other for peace. And the crowds yell, crucify Jesus. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed over to be crucified. Okay, we've traced twin trials, one religious and one Roman. And notice how the story doesn't put God at the center of this nightmare. It's clear that there are two institutions that are moving this plot along, one of faith and one of jurisdiction, and both are threatened by Jesus. Jesus, the guy in the tunic, who spent most of his time outside surrounded by poor people, who told stories about a better world and made people feel like they could be free. Jesus' singular life threatened both a religion and an empire. So they charge him with heresy and sedition. It is so unfair how something so small can threaten the status quo. And you know what's so true here? You can do everything right. You can make really, really good choices. You can live from your values and still end up in a nightmare. 
the end of a marriage, the friend who hates your guts, the luck that is never on your side. It does you no good to deny the brutal facts that you bear witness to in the world, that being human is hard, and that there is no guarantee that you'll stay safe. So we make space for that, even on Easter Sunday, because there is no way that you all showed up here today with everything in your life just perfect. So with that awareness, we go to the cross. At nine in the morning, they crucify Jesus. The charge above his head reads like this. Look at this guy, beaten and hardly breathing, quite the king of the Jews. And in his death, Jesus keeps company with criminals crucified on his left and his right. His friends are nowhere to be found. And at noon, a chilling darkness settles over the land. And at three o'clock, the people hear Jesus cry out, my God, my God, why have you left me here? And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. Now, these two verses together might be the most mind-bending verses in the Bible. When we read them in the NIV translation, we get a lot of space between the two instances. Death, new paragraph, curtain torn. But in the text, the two sentences are actually joined together. It's Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Immediately, there's a cosmic shift, a curtain torn in two. What's up with that? The last time Mark used the verb schizo, meaning to tear or split, was all the way back in Mark 1, verse 10. Jesus is baptized and heaven is torn open as the spirit descends on him like a dove. These two references, the sky torn and the temple curtain torn, are about removing barriers we think exist between us and God. You think God is far off in heaven and you are stuck here down below? The baptized Jesus tears that idea in two. You think God is hiding out in a temple and you need some incantation to access holiness? The crucified Jesus tears that idea in two. When you have reached the bottom, fallen into a low place, maybe that's exactly where the barrier you thought existed between you and God is ripped in two. Maybe it's right there at a scary beginning or a crushing ending that you fall right through to grace. Sometimes we rush out of Jesus's death moment, but when we stay, just a little longer, and really look at it, we come to affirm this truth. There is no place so low, so profane, so horrific that God is unwilling to go. And I know that doesn't make sense of why any hell on earth happens in the first place. Why do we have this freedom to forgive and then throw it away for revenge? Why do we shrink our humanity with hate instead of expanding it with love? Why do we battle and strike out and lie about so much so we can feel safe because we can because we're hurting because we're so afraid Jesus didn't come to show us how mighty and powerful God is while might and power might be true parts of God Jesus came to show us how 
capable of such horror we are. And not once, not once will God turn that horror back on us. God will absorb it. God will be lowered into it. God will transform it. Death will become new life. So we're here on Easter Sunday when the Sabbath was over. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb. And they asked each other, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And as they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side. The right side is this symbolic position of solidarity. And the women, they were alarmed. Don't be alarmed, said the young man. You are looking for Jesus, the Nazarene, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? But go, tell the disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee, where you will see him, just as he told you. And the Easter morning story What stands out to you? Maybe the presence of three women and no dude disciples? (laughs) There's Mary Magdalene, whose name could mean the tower. Another Mary, maybe even Jesus' mother, but seen here through the lens of her discipleship. There's Salome, possibly the mother of James and John, nicknamed Sons of Thunder, who with force like that, strangely, aren't here but their mother is. Maybe you're like, yeah, yeah, Bobby, yeah, the women, we get it. But what is up with this man in white? Is he an angel, a martyr, a reminder of Jesus' mountaintop transfiguration? Yes to all? Finally, maybe you notice the tomb where death was hiding has become the classroom of resurrection. I mean, can you imagine it? These women are on their way to the tomb and they think they are walking to the tragic end. They think that they'll find a lifeless body and treat it with love and respect. And after that, well, they'll figure out what to do with their grief. But it doesn't happen like that. They are told to get going, to head for Galilee, to go back to where It started because in the beginning, back in chapter one, Jesus came to Galilee to proclaim the good news that God was not far off but near, as close as this teacher's gestures, as curious as his stories, as good as every healing left in his wake. The gospel of Mark, it is a never-ending story. When you get to the end and you think you are left with nothing, you loop back to the beginning where all that you can see is hope. I think Mark wants you to know, to really experience for yourself that the Jesus story never ends. From Galilee to Jerusalem, back to Galilee, around and around and around we go. But here's the funny thing. For a resurrection story, we never actually see the goods. Mark doesn't deliver a shiny, resurrected Jesus. He just says, get going. You'll meet Jesus in the places you always met him. Now, I know it looks like Mark's gospel goes past verse 8, that it is widely believed that while those endings were added pretty early, sometime in the second century, they weren't part of what Mark wrote. And that's perfectly cool. Later, Christians wanted to pass on a picture of what unfolded. But for Mark... 
Maybe a more complete ending was just too much. Maybe when we try to explain everything, we lose the mystery of resurrection and we risk missing the point. Remember, Mark has been doing this all the way along. We've been talking about it for months. Mark wants you to discover Jesus for yourself. So we'll end today with what we know to be Mark's ending, his effort to turn the story over to you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Come on! After everything, they don't get it right? The women were told to go and tell the disciples and Peter that the resurrected Jesus would meet them in Galilee, and they run, and they gasp, and they say nothing, and they are afraid? Think about all the times in Mark's gospel Jesus told people after a sacred encounter that they should probably shush up about it. And finally, we're hearing the permission we've been waiting for. Speak, speak now, speak up. And instead, these women are silent and afraid. And honestly, I kind of like it. It does us no good to make these women so heroic that they lose their humanity. No, these women are disciples and apostles, just like every other disciple and apostle. They followed, they loved, they led, they served, they chickened out, they found their voice, and they tried again. They had to have. We wouldn't be here telling the story of what they saw if they didn't gather strength and try again. Their faith, their silence, and their fear belong perfectly in this story because it is so human. And Jesus came to tell us he'd meet us right here in every part of our humanity. So now it's over to you to see in every ending some sort of new beginning, no matter how scary that feels, to tell what Jesus has done for you, maybe with your words or your love or with your peaceful way through conflict. You will feel like you get it wrong some of the time, maybe even when it counts the most. And this is the beautiful thing about Mark's flawed messengers in the resurrection story. Even in their fear, they don't fail. In fact, they never could. The story was too good not to overcome their fears and yours because resurrection, it finds you. Even when you struggle to believe, this is what makes it Easter Sunday, the bright, warming sun of your faith. Let us pray. Loving God, it is a lot. It is so much to get to Easter. The highs and lows, the sorrow and exaltation, the abandonment, and the ever-present friendship of God. As we move into Easter time, the 50-day season your church has carved out where we explore our discipleship, won't you invite us into deeper devotion, into awe and mystery, and a trust that the story is ongoing, it is never-ending, and it involves us. May we practice faith through Easter tide, world without end. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm delighted to invite you back for our Easter tide series that begins next week. It's called Joy, a Theology of Celebration. As you go, we have a little macaron treat for you. If you didn't get one yet, the photo booth over there is open. Make sure you get photo booth picture, photo booth picture, on your own with your family, with friends. It's all welcome. 
And you can grab a blue bag to add some food to the pantry, to the commons cupboard. Finally, if you'd like someone to pray with you before you go, we always have a volunteer right up here who's honored to hear your story. Now we'll end as we always do. Love God, love people, tell the Easter story. Peace to you. Thanks so much, everyone.